Now, if you wouldn't mind standing, please. We are in the Gospel of John. Chapter 4, as we're continuing through the Bible verse by verse, John 4, 27. And at this point, his, Jesus' disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. Yet no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Could this be the Messiah? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged Jesus, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat, of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look at the fields, for they are already white with harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him, because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to Jesus, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe. Now we believe. Because not of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. And we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that you've left us this record of this encounter with a woman that changed a whole village. May we grow in you and understand what it is that you would have us do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, please. Now we believe. So we are looking at uh, the story of the woman at the well. And if you're just joining us, it's going to be a little hard to uh, follow. So I'll go back a little bit and uh, just uh, remind you how the story went. It's an encounter with a woman who was racially different than the disciples, the Jews. And they were prejudiced against Samaritans, so much so that they didn't even go through that section of the country. And it was a mixed uh, race because of the Assyrian army 700 years earlier came through and, and misplaced people, brought in Iranians and Greeks and, and Celts and just all different races of people, and then exported all the people that had lived in this area, Samaria. But it's a place that historically was where Abraham came originally, and then... Jacob had come, the grandson, the son, excuse me, and uh, he, no, I was right, Isaiah, I mean, okay, starting again. So Abraham came and he uh, worshiped there. I'm trying to help you get oriented and I can't remember who's on first. <clears throat> and Jacob came and dug a well there, thus she is at Jacob's well when Jesus arrives there because he goes through this prejudiced area that he doesn't know, he doesn't have anything to do with. In fact, Paul would say there's no longer Gentile or there's no longer Jew, there's no longer slave or free, there's no longer male or female. And this is the first encounter in the Gospel of John, this is the first year of Jesus' uh, ministry. Uh, the first time that there's this introduction to missions, bringing the good news to people that are different than those who had the, the message of the good news already. 
So Jesus comes and sits down at this well, and then this woman comes to get water. She comes at the middle of the day because it turns out she has a sordid past. She's been married five times, and she's living with a guy, the sixth guy, and she's not married to him. And Jesus asks her for a drink. Now, that's not too startling to us, but in the first century, it was unheard of. A Jewish man would never talk to a woman on the streets, even if it was of his own family, a rabbi particularly. But on top of that, this is a woman who is racially different. And the prejudice there are, are just as prejudiced as the South was in the United States. as prejudice as can be in the world. So Jesus breaks through a barrier here, actually three. He breaks through a religious barrier because the Samaritans are not practicing Jews. He breaks through the gender barrier by talking to a woman and a racial barrier because she was of a mixed race and he was colorblind as of course God is. So she uh, has this discussion, why are you talking to me? She's shocked that Jesus is even talking to a Samaritan woman. And uh, he said, uh, give me a drink of water. Why would you, a Jew, ask of me, a Samaritan, for anything? And he said, if you knew who you were talking to, if you realized who it was that you were having an encounter with right now, you would ask of me, Jesus speaking, and I would give you living water. The disciples come back. There's... uh, She goes back into the village, as we read, and I'm trying to point out to you the importance of this event in the Gospel of John and in Jesus' ministry, because his disciples are introduced to missions, to this concept of bringing the good news, something that we all have a call on our lives to do also. And uh, so it's uh, an opportunity that they were missing Now, uh, we have uh, a lot of illustrations of opportunities that people at the time didn't realize were simple. Thomas Edison died in 1931, but we still have much of his technology. The inventor of the light bulb, hello, the phonographic record, uh, motion pictures. Uh, He was awarded more than 1,000, 1,092 U.S. patents. He's just a brilliant guy. But he once said, opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work, a hardworking guy. We're talking about spiritual opportunities here in this story and this morning. Um, We are uh, watching the disciples miss a tremendous opportunity. And it wasn't dressed in overalls, it was the spiritual thing with the Samaritans. Those closest to Jesus were totally missing it. Opportunities are often not seen by the people who are closest to them. Missed opportunities. Albert Einstein didn't speak until he was four years old and did not read until he was seven years old. His parents thought he was subnormal, nice. And one of his teachers described uh, him as mentally slow, unsociable, and adrift forever in foolish dreams. He was expelled from high school, and they wouldn't admit him to the Zurich Polytechnic High School for slow learners. He finally eventually learned to speak and to do a little math. Astrophysicist, early rocket scientist Robert Goddard had a uh, design for the modern rocket, but he was rejected by all his uh, astrophysicist friends because they said uh, this would never work. The propulsion system won't work in outer space. Of course, that's what we're using today, still 80 years later after he invented it. Missed opportunities. Well, they're common, they surround us every day. Our English word opportunity comes from two Latin words, ob, O-B, portu, P-O-R-T-U, which was off port. And the picture in that day was before they could dredge out harbors, 
the ships that were bringing in goods, cargo, had to wait until high tide. And they were at port, off port, waiting. But they were ready to take advantage of the opportunity when it came. So opportunity, our English word, is very much us waiting for the moment when we can be useful in this case to God. So uh, this section that we looked at, we broke it up, we're breaking it up, I should say, into four parts. The first was Jesus and spiritual thirst when he has this encounter with this woman. It was uniquely for her. It says that he had to go through Samaria, a single woman with a questionable reputation of a different race that Jesus went out of his way to have an encounter with. I I can't overemphasize the importance of that because it happens to you. It, It happened to me. God brought someone into my life at exactly the right moment that I would be ready to hear about the gospel, about the good news that God had died for me. So the first section is on spiritual thirst, uh, the refreshment, the satisfaction that God's living water brings. The second section, this woman herself and Jesus told her all about herself and her background. And then this section is really on the disciples and their opportunity that they were missing, that Jesus had to slow them down and help them to see. And a couple of weeks, we'll look at the last section, which is the second miracle, the second sign that John, the writer of this gospel, says should lead us to the conclusion that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. That's where we're going, okay? Three parts to this section, the disciples learn about evangelism. You and I are disciples of him, 27 to 34. And then the importance of harvesting souls, very much like wheat, he describes it, at 35 through 38. And then the success of touching not just this woman, but the entire village, he would bring the gospel to a group of people a people group that had never heard the good news. That's where we're going. Let's jump in verse 27, about time. Let's get started. At this point, his disciples came. At this point when the woman was just leaving, it's God's perfect timing. They marveled that Jesus was talking to a woman, yet no one was brave enough to say, uh, What do you seek? Why are you talking with her? They were completely baffled by this. Now, they had left Jesus at the well. He was tired, sitting down, and he was going to get water. Uh, When It's interesting to note that if the disciples had come back any earlier, they would have interrupted this encounter with Jesus. But they come back at the exact moment when he's trying to teach them about evangelism, missions to people in the world. Now, the traditional site of Jacob's well, uh, we can't know for certain, but it is in the very area where the city of Sychar or Sumerians were. They marveled, yet nobody challenged Jesus. They were probably starting to notice by now that Jesus is talking to unusual people. Here he is talking to a woman, he's talking to a Samaritan woman, and they're probably thinking, who's he going to talk to next? He's probably going to be talking to tax collectors and prostitutes. Yeah, (laughs) that's where this is going, verse 28. The woman then left her water pot, the whole reason she came. She forgot to get water. Or maybe she knew she was coming back. And went her way into the city and spoke to the men. As the disciples approached, this woman is heading back to Sychar. Now, just a, this is a picture of, there's two mountains of which Sychar is in between. This is the top of the mountain of Gerizim, where there was a temple, and these Samaritans worshipped there. Rather than go down to Jerusalem to worship, right about the center you see Mount Gerizim. So Sychar is the village, and here's an old picture of it our old drawing of it, Shechem from an 1800 archaeologist, bottom right-hand corner is the well, and uh, 
there's the sign. I would strongly urge you, a little uh, tourist advertising here, to go to Israel. If you have never been to Israel, you have missed the joy of studying the Bible and discovering everything's exactly where it's supposed to be. And many of the things have been found by archaeologists based upon where the Bible says it exists. Now, subconsciously, I think, for most people, they don't get the importance of that. 2,000 years ago, Jesus sat at a well that you can still find today. And they still use today, and they still call it Jacob's Well, the Samaritans that still live there. And you'll find that in literally thousands of locations in Israel. It is a spiritual adventure that you should go. Now, we're, we are going again, Lord willing, get through all this weird COVID thing uh, in April. And we have room for 15 more people. Uh, we have a whole bus full and another second bus uh, started on. So there's room for 15 more people. I would urge you to go and see this well and a whole lot more than that. Here's the uh, a, a recent picture of Yet today it's uh, inside a Greek Orthodox church, just to make it a little more confusing. So a Jew comes to talk to a Samaritan, and then we cover it with a church from the Greek Orthodox denomination. Wow, follow that. She's so excited to find the Messiah that she becomes an evangelist. She goes into the city and she talks, notice it says to the men, because the women are not talking to her. They don't want to be seen with her. So they're listening. The men are listening. Come, she said. Come see a man, verse 29, who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And another translation said, you don't suppose this could be the, the Messiah, do you? Is it possible that he's here? Then they went out of the city. The Jews were uh, excited about the Messiah, but the Samaritans are even more excited. Now, you, you might remember if you were here that they only read the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, the, the books of Moses. And so they didn't have all the other history after that. They only believed in the first five books, but uh, right away, in Genesis, where it says the, the serpent's head will be crushed by the Messiah, the seed of Eve and Adam, uh, they're waiting for the Messiah. They're excited about that. So they pour out of the village. Uh, unlikely that the elders would listen to a woman, theologically, it's the first century. Deep prejudices against women. And, uh, but she didn't make any dogmatic pronouncements. She was wise. And uh, she's so sincere that it catches them off guard. And in the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Now, this is actually um, another encounter that John has placed in his gospel where the disciples don't get it. They're clueless. And John seems to, since he was one of the disciples, seems to enjoy reminding us, the reader, that they did not understand that they were with the Messiah. They didn't grasp that this was God the Son they were walking around Israel with every day. And so he always points out when they're talking about physical things instead of the spiritual things. And so they're bringing up food. Normal guys, right? Looking for the next meal. In the meantime, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat. We went into town, we got the food, and we've come back out. They're amazed to see that he's not hungry, but that he's energized. Why is he energized? Be it verse 32. I have food to eat, which you do not know. Something is sustaining him, he's saying, besides physical food. He's excited about serving the Lord, but he's really excited about opening the door to world evangelism. That's what this story is about. He's introducing his disciples to their responsibility to take the gospel into all the world. 
The disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? They're looking around for, you know, in and out burger packaging or something that Jesus had already eaten. And again, they're thinking literal, physical food. This is part of John's argument for the gospel. Even though they spent three and a half years walking around with Jesus, they didn't get that he was the Messiah, God the Son, until he rose from the dead. You remember, he shows up in the room with the doors locked and the windows locked. And Thomas said, I, I won't believe until I put my finger in his side. And he pops up in front of him and says, Thomas, come here. Thomas said, oh, no, no, I believe now. Give me your finger, Thomas. <laughs> and he put his finger in his side. So at this point, they're just amazed that he's a prophet, that he can do interesting miracles that he speaks with words that nobody has ever used before and he's introducing them to people that they would not ever talk to he said to them 34 my food is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work father god's work so what's father god's work that's still going on well creation is still going on you are part of his creation. You were knit together inside your mother's womb. God created you. Well, pastor, we understand uh, oxynucleic acid. You know, we, we understand the genetic code and mitosis, and they wind around 46 chromosomes, and, and we all come out a little bit different. No, no, God knit you together in your mother's room, womb. Well, I, I don't like what he did. We all have a complaint, you know, too tall, too short, my nose is too long, too big, my ears stick out. Everybody's complaining. God said, no, I like you. I like you just the way you are. You see, God has a love affair going on with you. He's deeply committed to you and your life. He wove you together, the Hebrew word. He wove you together inside your mother's womb. And it says, and he wrote down the days that were designed for you to live your life. God loves you personally. You matter to him desperately. He's chasing you right now trying to draw you deeper. It's safe to say about everyone, myself included. He's trying to draw us closer to him. So, um, creation is going on, but the second work that God is doing is redemption, and that's probably going on here this morning too. There's probably some people here you're visiting for the first time, and you're looking up here going, who is this guy? He doesn't have a collar. He doesn't wear any robes. Wasn't he playing the guitar? I don't think pastors can do that. Or is this a church or is this a rock concert? No, God is redeeming people. And he's going to describe redemption here. Listen, Jesus is echoing Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Well, that doesn't sound very nourishing, Pastor. I, I much prefer in and out. No, no, your soul and your spirit are starving without God, and his word fills you up in an area that only he can bring satisfaction to you. It's great satisfaction. Obedience to what God wanted him to do, God the Father wanted Jesus, God the Son to do, is summed up in the word obedience. That's what Jesus is doing, looking for us to do too. Verse 35. Okay, let me explain it to you. And it sounds like he changes subjects, but in fact, he's using the metaphor. He's using the different illustration. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look at the fields, for they are already white with harvest. Now, this makes the most sense if it's mid-December. We don't know, we're not told, but mid-December is when the wheat and barley are, come up 
they, they do dry land farming in Israel, still mostly to this day. But by mid-December, it looks like a lawn, slightly taller. But it will be mid-April before the heads appear. Now, we don't know anything about wheat. We live in California. We know about freeways, but not about wheat fields. So those of you that are from Kansas uh, know what he's saying here. The head goes up. It gets heavy. It bends over. It reflects the light. It, it looks white walking through a wheat field in Kansas. That's what he's talking about. But he's actually talking about a spiritual truth again. I say to you, look at the fields for they're already white with harvest. And he's probably doing this. This is one of those parables where he's pointing out to the city where, of Sychar where all these men are coming out. I showed you pictures of what Samaritans dressed like a couple of weeks ago, all white robes from neck to foot. And so th this white stream is coming towards them, looking like maybe a wheat field. So it's another living parable. Waiting for the spring to be harvested is missing an opportunity. Here's the message. From their elevated position, they, they saw uh, those, I showed you the map where the, the well is actually up a little bit on the edge of Mount Ebal looking over Mount Gerizim, and they could see him coming. His point is, there is urgency in this day, in your life and in mine, that don't wait. When opportunity knocks, be ready. Take it. Remember, it's the ship waiting outside the port to come in. Fields are filled with harvests of men, men right now ready to be gathered, is what he's saying. And then he takes the picture a step deeper, verse 36. He who reaps, the person who gathers someone into the kingdom of God, who prays with them, receives wages. Wages? I'm earning my way to heaven? No, no. The great blessing of leading someone to the Lord will lead to you standing in heaven someday and somebody standing next to you going, thank you. I'll be standing next to my wife because... I was the arrogant atheist biochemist who said, I don't believe in God. And she said, well, I can't convince you intellectually, but come to church with me. Ha, ha, ha. I went to church, though, for her birthday. It was a birthday gift for me. Changed my forever. I will stand by her in eternity and say thank you. No, no, I mean really, really thank you. This is amazing. This is paradise. This is close to Jesus. This is eternal life. He who reaps and gathers fruit for eternal life, to live for eternity, you are designed to live for eternity. Oh, come on, pastor. 50, 60, 70 years, 80 years, maybe 100. But no. Yes. You are designed to live for eternity. Now, this body is wearing out. Don't give me that look. Yours is too. <laughs> As we sit, oxidation is taking place. I can give you the biochemistry for it. <laughs> but we get a new one. And our soul and spirit will be joined with that in eternity. That is either the craziest sounding fairy tale in the world or it's the truth that God came to earth to tell us. He's designed this for eternity. May rejoice together over this spiritual truth. I wonder how many here this morning, you know that somebody prayed you into the kingdom of God. I, I found my great-great-grandmother's Bible, and she prayed for her great-great-great-grandchildren. And her daughter, my grandmother, prayed for her grandchildren. And my mother prayed for me. I thought I'm just, you know, bopping down the road of life, happy as can be, all free. No, God was chasing me down. Because someone, those, I'm trying to encourage you moms, you grandmothers, who are looking at your grandkids going, I don't think there's any hope. Yes, there is. God will answer your prayers. For in this saying is truth, one sows and another reaps. What's he saying? That guy you talked to at work who you've been working next to for several years. He said, uh, 
He said, you want to go somewhere this weekend? He said, nah, I'm going to church. And he said, church? You go to church? Yeah, and you tell him about it. That's planting a seed. And it doesn't have to be, you know, pull out your Bible and beat him over the head with it and slam it down his throat. Just be honest with what God has done in your life. And sometimes it's best to just say a little thing, plant a seed, and then back away and don't say anything else. Some people get that opportunity to plant. We all do. There's probably some watering going on here this morning, too, that somebody has shared with you, and you're sitting here going, is there anything about this church stuff, about this Jesus stuff? And I'm trying to water for him and for you. And then at the end of the service, we always give people an opportunity to receive the Lord, and that's the reaping part. I often have people come and say, well, you do that at every service. You ask people to raise their hands. I said, yeah. He said, do you ever have a time when people don't raise their hand? I said, oh, absolutely. But I'm still watering, and maybe I'm planting, and it's God who brings the increase. That's what's going on in this picture here. It's white for harvest. Opportunity is here. And the saying is true, one sows, you might sow, and you may never get an opportunity to reap. You, you may plant and never get an opportunity to water, but God will use it. No one who plants is really anything special besides obedient to God, the word of God in a person's heart. I was... Uh, talking with a young man a couple of weeks ago who talked about sharing with a guy at his job and they'd worked together for several years and he'd been sharing Christ with him in little bits for years and he came up and he said you know I, I'm kind of upset um, I said about he said my best friend uh, I, I brought him to church here several times and, and he never raised his hand he never received the Lord but he went with one other guy to the Baptist church last week and he got saved. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> what? <laughs> we get so parochial. We think we have a, a, a corner on truth. You know, we have the only real truth here at the packing house. Oh, yeah. Okay, sure. Keep planting, keep watering, and you might get an opportunity to harvest. 38, Jesus speaking, I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. In this situation, someone else had planted and watered. Others have labored, and you've entered into their labors. How so? Old Testament prophets that had spoken there. Jacob himself was a prophet. Abram had been there. So these people had received information about God, they just hadn't surrendered their life to him. Now, he might also be alluding to John the Baptist, because John was baptizing not very far from this area in Bethabara, and, and he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is right here. Turn from your sins, and God will cleanse you and heal you for eternity. So, Many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him, in Jesus, verse 39. Because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. This is interesting to take apart a moment and say, this woman, who is anything but holy in the sense of, or anything except religious, she's a very secular lady, and she's kind of bold when you read the encounter with Jesus. She's, uh, what are you doing talking to me? Uh, excuse me, ma'am, you're talking to God. <laughs> and God is using her to change a village. A woman who has a bad reputation I won't ask for a show of hands, but, you know, there's a couple of people in here that have a bad reputation besides just me. I grew up in this town. It's hilarious. Some of you are going, yeah, we heard about you, Pastor. 
It's probably true, whatever you heard. So this woman and I have had this ability to tell others about Jesus. He told me everything I ever did. And so the Samaritans, verse 40, uh, had come to him. They urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there three days. Now, if you are here last week, Pastor Greg uh, spoke from Luke chapter 9 about uh, the disciples going into the city of Samaria, trying to find a place to stay, and they wouldn't give him a place to stay. This is a separate occasion, but the disciples uh, came back, and James and John said, uh, you want us to burn down the city, Jesus? <laughs> And he said, no, I don't think you've been listening. <laughs> That's not what we're here for. But these Samaritans were excited about Jesus, and they asked him to stay, and he stayed two days longer. Now, all this prejudice I'm telling you is taking place between Jews and Samaritans. And he spends the night there. Now, I'm sure the disciples never thought they would ever spend the night in the Samaritan city. That'd be the last place they'd want to go. Well, it was there that they learned that God loves everybody. Every nation, every race, every tongue. And he plans on reaching the whole world through people like you and me. So they said to the woman, our verse 41, many more believed because of his word. It's snowballing what Jesus said. Many came because of what she said. But then when he stayed for two days, they heard God speaking. And then they said back to the woman, verse 42, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. And we know that this is indeed the Messiah. Now, they add to that, Savior of the world. Nobody else gets that in the Gospels until after Jesus died and rose, except these people. God opened their eyes to see things that the early believers did not see, that he wouldn't save just Jews. He wouldn't save just whatever your prejudice is, Caucasian. He wouldn't save, just fill in the blank. The savior of the world. <laughs> we serve a God that is colorblind and gender blind and position in life, slave or free, blind. Because he transcends all that and he sees every tribe, every nation, every tongue, he plans to fill heaven with. Um, because of John chapter four, evangelism is explained clearer than most places in the Bible. Uh, over the last, before COVID, uh, last few years, I've been going to Germany uh, and speaking at a pastor's conference of German pastors. Um, and it's in the city of Siegen. Now, some of you might remember Pastor Nick Long, who came and spoke here, and he's a, a real character. I love him deeply. And, uh, but the church was in a place that has a spiritual heritage. The Moravian missions came from there. That, that's not a, a church denomination that we have much on the West Coast, but it's all over the world. Moravian missionaries began in 1700 when a... German count, Count von Zindendorf, uh, in high school, uh, prayed to receive God and was radically changed. And he began to tell others. And his ministry was mostly to high school and college age people, 1700s. And if you visit Central America today, Nicaragua, Guatemala, there are many Moravian churches there. And their motto was the mustard seed, of just planting seeds all over the world. But there is an event I want to close with to help you wrap your mind around how important this idea of evangelism is to God. In 1732, two young German guys heard about a island off of Jamaica in the Caribbean 
that a British citizen had bought the entire island and he had planted it in sugarcane, making all kinds of money. But he said he would not allow any Christians there on the island. And he, his labor force were black Nigerians and the west coast of Africa. And um, he had 3,000 there. And these two German young men, 19 years old, heard about it and decided they wanted to bring the gospel to that island. There was no way to get on the island unless you were a slave. And so they sold their own lives into slavery to go work alongside 3,000 black Africans to share the gospel so that they might spend eternity with them. When they left on a ship from Hermholt, that's called just above Siegen, um, and uh, the whole group of churches in that area came together to see these two boys off on a sailing ship out of the harbor there. And they prayed with them. Everybody got down on their knees uh, on, the, uh, yeah, on the beach and the ship slowly began to pull away. And as it pulled away, uh, one of the young men jumped up on the edge of the ship and he shouted out that the lamb that was slain might receive his true reward for his suffering. The lamb, Jesus, that was slain, died for our sins, might receive the reward. You are the reward for his suffering. That saying you can find over the doors of Moravian churches today. A lady was here last night. She said, I went to Moravian University in Pennsylvania. She said, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't even know it was still open. She said, yeah. And that saying is on the chapel that the lamb might receive the due reward of his suffering people for eternity. Would you stand, please, and we'll pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you have come and you have died for us and created a bridge between here and eternity that all who would surrender you might cross over. Most of us in this room have done that, Lord, and we're excited, looking forward to seeing you face to face. But we pray for anyone that needs to surrender here now, this morning. Christians, please pray. So I wonder if there's someone here, maybe you are visiting for the first time. Maybe you've been here before. Maybe somebody's been speaking to you at work or a neighbor or at school. But you know you haven't surrendered to him. And you don't know if your sins are forgiven. And you don't know if you're going to spend eternity with him. This moment's for you. We wouldn't do anything to embarrass you. But if you'd like to know that your sins are forgiven, if you're ready to surrender your life to God, would you let me know you're ready by looking up at me and raising your hand? I won't embarrass you. God bless you, young lady. And we'll pray in a moment. And you, sir? God bless you. Two of you, yeah. God bless you. Anyone over here God is speaking to? Yes. God bless you. And you? Anyone over here I missed? If I miss your hand, don't worry. God never misses one. He's been waiting. Those of you that raised your hands, would you please pray out loud with the rest of it? We're going to ask God together to make it easy for you to forgive our sins. And he will do it right where you're standing. Everybody, please say, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Please forgive my sins. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Those of you that raised your hands, we'd encourage you to go over to these double doors to my right. Some of our elders are there. We'd love to give you a Bible, pray for you. If you're sick or you need prayer for other things, please go there. To the rest, God bless you. Have a wonderful day.